just jump right in. Our first speaker for today is Anna Tiley from the School of Agriculture and Food Science, and she's going to talk about investigating the circadian clock of Cymosatoria tritici. It's about time. <laughs> Okay, so hi, um, as Nicole said, I'm Anna. I'm an IRC fellow based in the School of Agriculture and Food Science. Um, and I work on Zymoseptoria, oops. <laughs> I work on a plant pathogen called Zymoseptoria triticae. This, this is a fungus that infects wheat and it's a major threat to global food production. I'm particularly interested in the circadian clock of Zymoseptoria triticae. So circadian clocks are ways um, in which organisms, including humans, can synchronize their biological processes to their surrounding environment. And the theory behind my research is that maybe this fungus has its own circadian clock, and if it does, maybe it uses this to synchronize its pathogenicity with the host. So, for example, the pathogen might have an optimal time for it to infect the host when the immune system is low, and then at the end of infection, there might also be an optimal time for the fungus to release its spores to enable rapid dispersal in the field. Some of the things that I've been looking at for this have been infecting wheat with the fungus at different times of the day to see the effect on the infection. And I've also identified some of the key genes which could actually be regulating the circadian species. Um, so some of the key genes regulating the circadian clock in the species. So some of these mutants, I've deleted some of the circadian genes and I'm trying to see if they might not be able to tell the time. And if they can't tell the time, maybe they're worse at infecting the host. I really hope that this um, research might be able to help controlling the pathogen in the field. So for example, maybe there's an optimal time for farmers to spray fungicides. And then by doing this, we can actually reduce fungicide usage. So hopefully this can help fight some of the zero hunger um, strategies as well as helping the environment. So thank you very much and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much. That was really interesting talk. Hi. Do you have, do you have any, extent, do you have any uh, understanding at this stage how damaging a particular pathogen is? You know, do you know the extent that it will have on certain crops and things like that? Yeah, so, oh, sorry, someone's microphone is on. Um, okay, um, yeah, so this pathogen, um, without fungicides, it can lead up to about 50% yield loss. At the moment, I think it's the number one pathogen of wheat in Europe. So for countries like in Ireland and the UK, it's a major problem. Um, yeah, so that's um, as much as I know at the moment. Yeah, so really significant then. So. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And um, I think most of the fungicides currently sprayed in the EU are targeted against this pathogen as well. Uh, but it can evolve really rapidly in the field and we don't have any methods that are 100% durable against it. So maybe this research can kind of help as well. Yeah, cool. Well done. Thanks. Which is going to be Veronica Fruja um, it. from the School of Biology and um, Environmental Biology. And um, they're talking about a little less than 20,000 leagues under the sea. Okay, so I'm just going to share the screen now. Is that good? Okay, great. So, good afternoon. I'm Veronica and I'm a PhD student in the School of Biology and Environmental Science. And I'd like to start by taking a few seconds to talk about thousand kilometers. So it looks like myself and Jules Verne differ slightly in opinion because I think that the most fascinating, mind-blowing stuff in the world is actually found only up to about 200 meters below sea level. That's less than one league. And I'm talking, of course, about seaweeds. Now, my research is focused in particular on seaweeds on artificial structures, such as seawalls. But why should we care? Well, we just can't seem to stop building them. As human populations grow, especially around coastlines, Natural shores are steadily being replaced by more and more seawalls, breakwaters, and all kinds of other artificial structures. So the question is, how does this affect marine life and how do we mitigate these effects? Seaweeds in particular are fundamental to shallow water marine ecosystems because anything that affects seaweeds changes the whole system. 
So I'm looking at this species, Fucus vesiculosus, which is common on Irish rocky shores, to see whether its populations differ in artificial structures. For example, do they grow at a different rate or do they reproduce at different times? I'm also looking at ways to improve biodiversity on artificial structures. And one potential solution is these vertipools, artificial rock pools designed and engineered by a company called Articology. I've deployed a number of these under different environmental conditions to see how they perform. They've only been out for a few months so far, but they seem to be doing well enough. In this slide, you can see that an anemone has taken up residence in the top right of the pool. So I'm funded by a variety of excellent organizations, including the IRC and the EcoStructure Project. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. It's a question if no one's... In. Okay, and um, I was just wondering what sort of timeline are we talking about? Like, so how long have those articology structures been up? Like, how long does it take something to, like, what sort of timeline are we talking about on this succession? Um, and then after how long would you expect it to see maybe what we're seeing in more natural habitats? So they've been out so far for six months. Um, and generally, you would expect to see the first colonization to start at around this time. So they, at about three months, we'd expect biofilm to form. And then about now you start getting things populating, but they wouldn't settle down until about a year has passed. So we're going to be sampling them at six months, uh, nine months, 12 months, and hopefully 18 months. And then basically the longer they can stay out, the better. And then I think Jackie's got a question. A great talk. Uh, is there any part of the study that might look at um, potential um, damage, say, of, of some of these structures on the, you know, the sort of structure of the seawall itself? I'm trying to thinking, you know, if, if biodiversity is the main aim, but some of these might lead to sort of structural damage at some point. Is that is that possible to assess at the same time? Or I'm not sure it would be possible to assess at the same time uh, it's certainly a, de a very interesting question and an aspect that is very important because you know engineers won't consider including these on their structures if they can potentially cause damage uh, the rock pools that we're using um, just need anchor bolts into three points on the surface and we're only we've only deployed them so far on concrete seawalls so we've avoided those uh, seawalls, which are conglomerates and uh, um, which are slightly older, perhaps. Uh, but it would definitely be an interesting thing to look at um, with the intention of rolling these out as, as an actual solution. Okay. Great work. Thank you. Thanks. And then, uh, yeah, John, if you've got a question as well. Yeah. Hi there. I just wonder about spatial size, because those pools you look to be one size mm -hmm. um, but I guess rocky shores you know communities can stretch over much bigger sizes so do you think the spatial size of those communities that you're creating on those eco uh, structures has a has an effect if you had bigger ones or smaller ones or? absolutely and while my experiment is focused on how they perform under different environmental conditions so we stuck to one size um, previous experiments using these sorts of pools uh, for example by Alice Hall in Burnmouth I think um, have looked at the um, the you know the one large and multiple small and those sorts of um, experimental designs so it is an it is a question that has been addressed and which would warrant further research. All right, very good. Um, I'd say we'll move on to the next speaker. Next up is Daniel Giles from the School of Mathematics and Statistics, and he's going to talk about the development of operational tools for tsunami warning centers. Dan? Yep, so hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so I won't be sharing my screen, so if you could just make sure that your Zoom is in the speaker view and not grid view. Um, so you should now see the title of my slide appear. Okay, so I'll start. So hi, I'm Dan Giles. I'm a PhD student in the School of Maths and Stats, and my research is focused on the development of operational tools for tsunami warning centers. Um, after the devastating uh, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, there was a concerted effort by the scientific community 
to develop tsunami warning centres, deploy tsunami wave gauges and increase public awareness, all with the goal of decreasing the societal impact from these natural hazards. However, to understand the challenges placed upon tsunami warning centres, it is important to understand the dynamics of tsunamis themselves. Tsunamis exhibit small wave heights and long wavelengths in open ocean. It is only when they come into contact with a continental shelf or coastal waters that their wavelength decreases and amplitude increases via a process called showing, shoaling. Owing to their long wavelengths, they travel at extremely high speeds in open ocean, comparable to that of a jet engine. Thus, arrival times on the coastline can be on the order of minutes. Tsunami warning centers are therefore tasked with detecting tsunami sources, deducing the level of threat posed, deciding on the areas most at risk, and then notifying the relevant authorities, all within severe time constraints. The bulk of my PhD to date has been focused on developing a code which is capable of simulating tsunamis in a faster than real time setting, as it is painfully obvious that a simulation which completes after a tsunami has arrived is of no use to a warning center. To give you an idea of this, I include the following plot, where 20 separate realizations of a tsunami source, which are needed to capture the uncertainty, are simulated for four hours for the Mediterranean. The resultant maximum wave heights are then outputted and plotted on the outside. Using our numerical code, these 24 hour simulations are completed in 97 seconds, evidently faster than I can finish this blast off. The outside figures are then combined to give absolute and mean maximum wave heights plotted in the center. This will allow tsunami warning centers to rapidly deduce the level of threat posed by such an event and to identify the sections of coastline most at risk. So thanks for listening and shout out to my supervisor, Frederick, and the funding IRC. Could I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I was wondering if in your research, are you finding that um, would, would what you're proposing be possible to be used with um, or in tsunami warning centers globally? And is there, are there big differences between um, the sort of the development of warning centers? In your uh, so, yeah, so what we're proposing is uh, we've developed a, a numerical code that is capable of simulating uh, tsunamis in a faster than real time context. So that would be applicable across the globe. Um, but yes, so your question then in relation to various tsunami warning centers. So yes, within even within Europe, there's multiple tsunami warning centers. The one we work closely with is Senalt, based in uh, France, but there are multiple in Europe and all tsunami warning centers generally have their own kind of approaches and tools. Uh, so yeah, there's, depends who you ask. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, could I just ask a question? Uh, that was, again, a really interesting talk. The faster than real time, I get the purpose of that from a warning perspective, but the physics of it, like how do you model a tsunami faster than real time? Uh, you see where I'm coming at? I, I, I totally understand why you'd want to do that from a warning perspective, but is there, where, yeah. in, in a sense, where's the physics behind saying that that ever happens? Or is there examples that that, those speeds that you've kind of matched ever ever kind of occur? Uh, no, so they, they definitely do not occur. So the, the idea is that we still use, uh, we still solve the same set of equations that most other tsunami codes would solve, but we're able to get a faster and real time result because we use various computa computational techniques like parallelization and using GPUs. So you still say, you still solve the same physics equations. Um, and it's with embedded in that is the, the same speeds of the tsunami waves themselves. But it's just that the results come before the actual event, how, how fast the actual event happens. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Well done. No uh, we move on to the next speaker then. Um, the next speaker is Katie Byrne from the School of Agriculture and Food Science. And she's going to talk about buzzing about pollinators, but who's getting left out of the conversation? Unmute myself for a start. Can everyone see that okay? Okay. 
As many of you know, insect pollinators are important for both wild plant and crop pollination. Unfortunately, there's evidence to suggest that these insects are in decline. So it's more important than ever that we create pollinator-friendly landscapes. However, to do this on a nationwide scale, we need to make sure that people are excited about pollinators and know enough about them to effectively protect them. So to do this, we distributed a nationwide survey it's not working. Um, oh, I'll just go. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, we distributed a nationwide survey to determine how uh, pollinators are currently perceived by the Irish public and identify potential target audiences. And what we found was generally encouraging. It seemed that the people already are aware that pollinators are important and that they're in decline, and most people are already taking action to protect them, which is fantastic news. However, despite general enthusiasm for protecting pollinators, um, the public knowledge of pollinators was mostly limited to large charismatic insects like honeybees and butterflies, while pollinators like flies and wasps, who are commonly perceived as pests, um, were unfortunately not recognized as important pollinators. Um, additionally, less than 50% of our participants had ever heard of Ireland's only pollinator conservation initiative, the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, which suggests that people are getting their information from global and not necessarily accurate sources rather than locally adapted sources. We also found that both Irish city dwellers and students may not currently feel empowered to engage with uh, pollinator conservation action. So in order to not leave out any pollinators or people out of this conversation, we see a need for more specific engagement campaigns to boost the image of these lesser known pollinators, promote our local conservation initiatives, and provide targeted actions to Irish city dwellers and to students. And hopefully this way we can protect pollinators for future generations. Thank you. Just one question, I uh, really enjoyed your talk. When you were looking at attitudes towards pollinators and levels of information, was there any stakeholder difference? Did you look, did you, were you able to compare the results to older, younger, uh, education level, city dwellers, country yeah, dwellers, so that, that was, sort of thing? Yeah, so that was one of the things we were looking at. So um, we found that, uh, that city dwellers and like university students, they were the ones who were least likely to have engaged with current pollinator conservation initiatives. And there were also indications in some of their write-in answers that people who live in cities or maybe don't own land feel like um, pollinator conservation isn't really for them um, and isn't something that they're able to engage with because they don't have as much control over their landscaping. Um, and I mean, contrarily, there's lots of things you can do in cities to help pollinators. You can you know, if you're part of a community, you can get that sort of land involved, you can make window boxes, um, education is a huge one. So um, we're thinking it might be a really great improvement on current uh, conservation initiatives to provide targeted answers um, or actions for city dwellers and students. We already have a really great array of them for like, gardeners and council members and um, uh, even members of the church. So um, this would just kind of be another one that would further the reach of pollinator conservation initiatives. Yeah, I guess that's kind of linked to the question that Edwin's asked on the chat on some first ideas about campaigns to to get that going. Yeah, so I mean a big one is uh, like I do I try and do as much public engagement work as possible, um, but making sure that our conversations around pollinators aren't just focused on the honeybee. So that's probably the biggest one. Um, honeybees are kind of like the poster child for pollinator conservation, um, but there are only one species and they're a managed one. Um, and there are like over there are hundreds of pollinator species here in Ireland alone and thousands globally. Um, so it's important that we're sort of involving all of them in the conversation. So that's sort of, I think, one of the biggest main steps that we could take is uh, just sort of instead of keeping our focus just on this one species, maybe spreading it out a little bit more um, and highlighting these other pollinators. Because I mean, it's funny, I, I think people when they think of flies, they think of something that's really gross and like, well, it's a pest. But if you really look closely, most of them are actually mimicking the patterns of bees and wasps and things. So they're just as pretty, they're just maybe a little misunderstood. <laughs> okay, 
Great, thank you so much, Katie. Um, our next speaker is going to be Besta Mosafari from the School of Civil Engineering, and they're going to talk about improving our understanding of hydrology and nutrient exports from Irish peatlands. Thank you very much. So, okay. At the end of the last ice age, about 10,000 years ago, heat formation began, and for millennia, millennia uh, they've been important carbon reservoirs on the Earth. Now, through uh, uh, this uh, warming planet and new weather patterns, the future of peace parks has been called into question, including how fast they might start rele releasing all their stored carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. As peatlands currently are used for many different purposes, such as agriculture and forestry, and they are uh, harvested to provide peat for energy, what would happen if these carbon reservoirs were completely obliterated? We can say if all the carbon in the world's peatlands were uh, vaporized, roughly about twice the volume that's been added since the start of the industrial revolution would pour back into the atmosphere. In other words, if we treat peatlands badly, drain them and dig them up, they become major carbon chimneys. So considering the great importance of peatlands, my research team and I aim to improve our understanding of Irish peatlands in two stages. First of all, like the blood circulating in our bodies, water is vital for peatland survival. And we can measure its circulation, for example, as rainfall or fluxes using hydrology. Furthermore, we can monitor and get the pulse of peatlands by collecting water quality data. Secondly, using the data we collected, we aim to develop computer models, which helps us to look at and predict peatlands vital signs and where it's necessary help to make remedial action. After enhancing our understanding of peatlands, we can answer this question with more confidence, whether we are going to mitigate climate change or contribute to it. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And you know, the whole Midlands and a lot of those peat areas were drained with those artificial drains. And I'm just wondering if you have any scope in your study to kind of look at the impact of some of those schemes. You know, they have a very high density on, on some of the, um, you know, the solutions that you might be looking at. Um, yeah, and I mean, after modeling, um, we may have some prediction of the future to take into account, uh, for example, uh, by reverting those uh, drained and extracted peatlands in Ireland. And yeah, we can predict uh, the, the future of these peatlands in Ireland. Great, well done. Thanks. Uh, John, if you've got a question. Yeah, hi there. Yeah, I know Ireland's done a good job at extracting peat from its peatlands. But, um, do your methods um, apply to other parts of the world? I mean, there are other peatlands around the world where your kind of assessments might be useful, maybe uh, boreal peatlands or other areas? Yeah, of course. Uh, it would be useful because uh, for the hydrological model, uh, the input parameters are the same as all peatlands in the world, for example, with uh, the input data of rainfall, um, groundwater level, evapotranspiration, and all of these uh, hydrological data, as well as some uh, water quality data and nutrients in peatlands, for example, phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, we can use those developed models for all peatlands. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Let's just move straight on to the next speaker. Um, next speaker is Elise Alonzi from the School of Archaeology, and she's going to talk about questioning connectedness, the biogeochemical um, evidence for mobility in medieval Irish communities. Thank you, Nicole. Um, happy Earth Day, everyone. And uh, I'm an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellow in UCD School of Archaeology. And today I'll be speaking about mobility in medieval Ireland. In the talk, I'll show you how I use biogeochemistry to interpret ancient mobility. In my work, I study how people move 
in medieval Ireland, and I will tell you about the implications of the rates of mobility on community life. You may be familiar with medieval Ireland in general. The medieval Irish were prolific in their creation of texts. You might have seen the beautifully illustrated manuscripts, such as the Book of Kells, which were produced at monasteries. At these monasteries, people joined a religious community to practice religion apart from the general lay community. Most monastic sites were used as burial grounds. And it is an analysis of these. Briefly, I use the concept, you are what you eat, to study where people lived and how they traveled by comparing the biogeochemistry of the environment and human remains. I use a specific type of chemical variant called an isotope to quantify how some parts of the landscape are different than others. In order to do this, I have to take plant samples from all over Ireland. I then analyze the plant and human samples in a large machine called a mass spectrometer at the National Center for Isotope Geochemistry here at University College Dublin and I compare the results to estimate if the people grew up in and lived in the area in which they were buried. My results indicate that of the 80 individuals tested so far, 13.6% are non-locals to the site at which they were buried, and none are definitely from outside of Ireland. When the laboratory work resumes, I will be finishing the analyses at two more sites. Interestingly, this percentage of non-locals is quite low in comparison to other sites around the world and it is certainly at odds with the narrative of the interconnected, highly mobile monks and saints painted in medieval texts. Why might this be? Well, medieval Ireland had a highly developed set of laws and people don't usually have rights outside of their own tua in medieval Ireland or kingdom. As of now, it looks like medieval Irish people were not afforded the right to move freely across the landscape as they might envision in our rosy view of the less populated past. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? question please um lovely talk um this this notion of mobility and connectedness is something we really cherish nowadays <laughs> um especially at this strange time i was wondering perhaps if um if if you could maybe explain what's the most challenging aspect of your study the most challenging aspect yeah uh, a lot of times it would be preservation so um obviously i only work with sites that have been excavated um beforehand currently there's a lot of kind of backlog in um human skeletal remains. And then also it's just a fight against time to actually analyze before the chemical evidence is faded away into the soil. And do you have specific case study areas um, across Ireland that you're looking at in particular? I do. Well, it, I, I usually look for a good example of a monastic site. And then, um, so I've looked in Tipperary and Wexford and Clare, but then I, I do the kind of ecological, geological testing in each county that the sites are in. So I kind of take an all Ireland approach, but then um, specifically hone in when I find a good site to work on. Great. Thanks. Dara has a question as well. Yeah, that's really, that was really uh, fascinating. Just a really basic question for me. Uh, you say you're looking at, at, at different plants, but out of interest, what kind of plants were people using and eating and stuff around these time periods? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting because for what I do with radiogenic strontium isotopes, really um, it's only the root depth that, that changes. The species doesn't actually change what isotope you'd find in them. But I do like to use um, obviously plants that simulate what people ate in the past. So they might have been eating barley um, or other crops like that. Um, but then also people ate a lot of uh, dairy. So you might be getting values that were averaged by the, the cattle in the past um, that then get into the human system. Um, there's also seafood and that's a separate issue as well. So yeah, we do, we do try to use this other isotopes actually and other um, methods of analyzing food byproducts and remains to, to understand that. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much for that. Thank um, you. Let's move on to the next speaker. Um, next up is Edwin Alblas from the Sutherland School of Law. He's going to talk about environmental cooperatives in the Netherlands, bridge between farmers and nature. Your mic is muted. Yeah, <laughs> I'll <laughs> mute myself first. Um, it's a good start. So I'll share my screen. Just checking if this is working. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, I think it all works, so I'll just start. 
So hi everyone, hope you're all keeping well. I'm uh, very excited to present my research on environmental cooperatives. Before we start, I have a little icebreaker. So use your response reaction to check what is this bird? Is it a godwit? Press the thumbs up or a curlew? Press claps. Yeah, so uh, it is a godwit. That was the correct answer. Grotto in Dutch. Uh, maybe an even better answer would have been a big thumbs down though, because this bird and just tons of other uh, species are doing very poorly now, mainly as a result of intensified agriculture. Now, if you look at the EU context, the EU has some very ambitious laws, really strong rules. But if you look at its agricultural policies, only a tiny bit of its budget actually goes towards promoting sustainable farming practices. And even then, it's not very effective, mostly. In the Netherlands, a very new approach is now being taken, revolving around environmental cooperatives. These are groups of farmers, citizens, environmental organizations, all working together to collectively achieve environmental objectives. And doing so, they've been given a lot of responsibility by the government. They now distribute all the subsidies among the members, they monitor the results, they enforce the rules, so they can even give uh, self-regulatory power uh, that used to be with the state and now has gone to these farmers themselves, these groups themselves. Now what I'm doing is really using a law and governance kind of lens to try and find out what the effect is of this move towards self-regulation and really trying to find out if this has made the rules more effective and helps to bridge the gap between what these ambitious laws say and what is actually happening in practice. And then hopefully in the future uh, and um, be happy to answer any questions. Well, if, if that's okay. Um, yeah, it was a great talk. And again, it's a, it's a fantastic area to be researching in. I'd be just keen to hear a little bit more about your methods, like how you're going to do this. Again, have you got some case studies? Have you got areas where they've transitioned into this style of governance? Just a little bit more on that. Yeah, so I kind of hoped someone would ask this question because I didn't have enough time to put it all in the presentation. Uh, basically, there's 40 cooperatives now, and this is the only model, the only way in the Netherlands that you can avail of any agri-environmental subsidies. So if you want to get any subsidies for this kind of work, you have to be part of one of the cooperatives. And what I'm doing is basically doing interviews with a selection of the cooperatives and really trying to find out how does this work in practice that they have all this sort of self-regulatory power that used to belong to the state. Um, like, how does it work if you have to give your neighbor a fine, for instance, for not doing what he's supposed to do? How does it work when you have to set your own rules? Um, does it make the situation better in terms of complying with the overall rules or does the opposite happen? And so that's what I'm doing, mostly doing interviews, a qualitative analysis and a legal analysis as well. So. Great, that'll be fascinating to watch the outcomes. That'll be great. Yeah, so far it's been really interesting. Uh, thanks. There's also a question in the chat. Should I just answer that? Uh, yeah, question from Ellie. So how long have these policies been in place now and do they seem to be working so far? Yeah, so this was 2016 that the Netherlands adopted this as the sole model. There used to be, uh, well, there, wa there was a bit of a combination in place first with some cooperatives just doing this out of their own initiative, but now this is the only model. And um, so far, I think that it's been, it's difficult to say if it's been effective in terms of ecological effects because 2016 to 2020 is a short period. But what I do see from my results now is that these farmers have become much more motivated because the rules are not more, not, not as top down anymore. They're way more bottom up. They can do their own thing and they have more um, power to decide, to communicate with each other. So it really helps in, in terms of making them more motivated. So I think at least in that sense, it's been effective. And the Netherlands is really the only country where something like this is happening. You have the burn scheme, in Ireland, which is sort of similar, but for the rest, it's really unique in, in Europe. So. Thanks. Very good, thank you. Um, next up is gonna be Lindsay J. Thompson from the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences, and she has bad news for bees. Uh, Neonicotinoids aren't the only harmful pesticides. So I'll just share my screen quick. Can everyone hear me? Uh, there we go. Cool. 
Okay, so pesticides are an important component of many agricultural systems, but they've become really controversial in recent years. And this is mostly due to their effects on bees, um, particularly neonicotinoids, which are a class of insecticides. But little attention is paid to non-insecticide pesticides, such as fungicides and herbicides. And this makes sense because they're not designed to target insects. But recent research does indicate that they do have, well, they can have negative effects on bees. So a systematic review found that there were only 89 papers associated with the effects of fungicides, herbicides, and bees compared to a review on neonicotinoids that found nearly 300. So most research focused on one species of honey, uh, one species of bee, which is Apis mellifera, which is a honeybee. But there are approximately 20,000 species of bee in the world, and different bees can react differently to pesticide exposure. And also most research focused on mortality. And whilst this is important, bees can, bees can forage on sublethal levels of pesticides in the environment. And we know from the neonicotinoid literature that this can have effects on crucial behaviors that bees have. For example, it can affect foraging ability, navigation, and the ability for the colony to grow. So my research aims to investigate the effects of the most applied fungicide and herbicide in Ireland and look at the effects on colony growth, foraging and learning a memory in a single bumblebee species as this is one of, one of the most important pollinator groups in Ireland. Hopefully this will also contribute to understanding of the mode of action of these pesticides in bees because this is largely unknown and hopefully from there we'll be, we'll be able to begin to mitigate against any impacts that we find and contribute to the sustainable use of pesticides. Thank you very much. I have a question. Everything for questions. Anna, yeah, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, so I was curious, do you have like a, a theory of what the mode of action might be of the fungicides to the bees or, or are there any theories um, about not personally, um, but there is some literature that suggests that it could be um, that it, it affects the uh, microbiota similar to herbicides um, and that it can also um, result in like a lowered immune response so that then the, the bees become, um, what's the word, they become more vulnerable to other stresses such as like pests and disease. Okay, really interesting. Good talk. Thanks. Karen's got a question as well. Yeah, great talk indeed. Uh, just wondering at this stage, have you looked at what methodologies are you looking at to actually test your hypothesis? Okay, yeah, so there's a few different things that we can do with these. So to look at colony growth, this can be really simple as dosing whole bee colonies with pesticides and then tracking their growth over time after they've been exposed and seeing how this differs between treatments. For learning and memory, there is uh, quite an established protocol for looking at this in bees where we can use the proboscis extension reflex um, where we essentially train a bee to extend its proboscis when we uh, present a particular scent and we can see if different pesticides affect this and then if they can remember this response over time and then in terms of foraging we can do different things with this so I'm hoping to use RFID so I can track how often uh, forager bees will enter and exit the colony but I'm also hoping to look at the amount of pollen that bees are returning to the hive and the number of uh, pollen foragers returning to the colony as well. Thanks. Very good, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Alan O'Carroll from the School of Archaeology, and they're talking about cesspits and waste layers, the key to our past. Sorry, I'm just sharing the screen. Can everybody see it? Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm a postdoc in the School of Archaeology in UCD working on the ERC funded food cult project. So cess and waste are what we dispose of as quickly and as possibly as, as effectively in today's world. The quicker our waste is out of sight, the better. However, for archaeologists, these layers hold invaluable information about our past lives and how we lived those lives. Oh, I can't seem to go to the next screen. Oh, there we go. The Food Cult project is analysing evidence from hundreds of archaeological excavations across Ireland. Sometimes during an excavation, archaeologists find the actual remains of food, such as seeds, pips, and animal bones. 
as well as food related objects such as pots and knives. They are often found in cesspits and waste layers. People deposited household waste as well as lottering waste in these deposits. So in the Food Cup project, we will collate, analyze and model food data to produce regional and social patterns of use. Although we're at a very early stage of the Food Cult project, some interesting facts are emerging already. Long before donut kiosks, grapes and figs were eaten in O'Connell Street in Dublin City. Lentils came to Ireland long before the 1970s and were eaten and then deposited as waste in Cork. However, we know that cereals were the main state crop for much of the population, which includes breads, gruels, and beers, and not the potato. We also know from these deposits that global waste has a very long history in Ireland. China spotter ware from the Ming Dynasty was imported into Cork and Dublin, indicating far reaching trade networks. So, next time you look at your rubbish and toilet waste, especially those empty wine bottles. Think of the future and what it might tell them about the way you live your life today. Thank you for listening. And if you want to find out more about the project, uh, we have a great website, foodcult.eu. Yeah. Thank you very much. I feel seen now <laughs> with that wine bottle comment. Um, John's got a question. John, have you got a, a question? Or are you still on mute? Still on mute. Hi, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for the talk, that was great. Um, I just wondering, how, how far back in time can you go when you're studying cesspits and waste? Um, cesspits bits are generally so associated with urban deposits, um, waterlogged in uh, biking periods, but they can go back as far as far as possible as long as you have the right preservation qualities. You can go back as far as the Mesolithic, uh, the cesp, as long as they're waterlogged. Waterlogged deposits preserves all the pips and the, the waste, um, the mosses and whatever was used and thrown into these waterlogged pits. It's a bit like a, a peat bog kind of preserve. Sorry? A bit like a peat bog might preserve things. In Absolutely, an that's exactly what they are, yeah. Yeah, waterlogged deposits. Cool, and then I think there's also a question from Jackie. Yeah, that was great. Mine is sort of a continuation from that, actually. Um, it, it was about, yeah, if you're dating using radiocarbon, just, I suppose, some sort of dating control on that, or whether you're using the artifacts like just looking at the wine bottles there, whether you're using some of the artifacts to kind of date as well? We're using, uh, yeah, that's a good question. We're using both. We're using C14 dating. From, we record everything by context. So everything is given a context or a layer. And that layer can be either C14 dated or it can be dated by the artifacts that are found within that layer. So we're going to be modeling. Uh, we've got, we're going to take on a data modeler who will model all the dates and the artifacts and uh, give us a, a, a better lot, a timeline on the, the features and the context and the time, the time periods when these um, objects were imported into Ireland and used. Uh, and then we can spatially look at them throughout Ireland. Great, well done, sounds fascinating. I have a question if I may. Um, I was wondering if you're focusing mainly on urban areas, and if you are collaborating to any extent with anthropologists, economists, and so on, um, on, on this project? Uh, that's a good question as well. We're looking at all areas of Ireland. So we're looking at Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland as well. And we're looking at urban, we're going to be comparing urban and rural deposits at, uh, and different social classes. So uh, we can tell the different type of people that lived at different archeological sites from the excavations uh, from a lot of the objects. So what was the second part of the question? Um, I was wondering if on, on, in your team, on your project, if you were linking up with any anthropologists or economists or, or which other disciplines feed into your studies? Oh, we've, yeah, it's very multidisciplinary. We have uh, a historian, uh, 
Susan Flavin is running the, the project. She's a historian in Trinity and we have a scientific lipid analysis. So we're going to be looking at lipids on the pots and the objects to see what type of foodstuffs they had in the, in the, the pots, uh, what type of food they were eating. We'd be able to tell from the lipids that were left on the side of the pots. And we have an osteoarchaeologist working with us as well, who's going to look at the human bones and isotope analysis, uh, what type, like what Elise was talking about, um, what type of foods that were ingested into the body. So, but we haven't, uh, we're not, yeah, we, we're not collaborating with the economists at the moment, but other than that, I think there's everybody else. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Let's move on. Uh, to Christine Coppinger's presentation. She's from the School of Agriculture and Food Science and she's going to talk about pollinators and pollination in Central Africa, their importance for woodlands and livelihoods through the forest production provision. I'll just get going then. Um, so I'm sure by now most of you have heard about pollinators and that one in every three bites of food is available to us thanks to the work of, of pollinators, not to mention an array of other ecosystem services and functions provided by roughly 90% of plants globally that depend on pollinators to reproduce. So pollinators also play an important role in Central African woodlands for providing forest products and services to local people. But the problem is their contribution to these services isn't well understood. Researchers have recognized though, that there is a dis disproportional dependence on pollinators in Africa, where they ensure the provision of essential nutrients and alleviate against poverty and malnutrition. The catch though, is that the welfare of pollinators is inextricably, inextricably linked to that of natural habitats. Rural subsistence communities in the same way um, are also heavily reliant on natural resources, including woodlands and products derived from them. So woodlands historically in Zambia covered up to 70% of the land area, but growing human populations coupled with development and unsustainable forest uses has resulted in extensive deforestation. Information on the role of pollinators for providing forest products and services and the value of intact forests for supporting pollinators in rural communities is really urgently, urgently needed now to understand the implications of this forest loss and how these impacts could be mitigated. So to address this information gap, my study is combining socioeconomic data on the role of forests for supporting rural livelihoods, along with ecological information on pollinators and plant pollinator interactions to provide information that will hopefully be useful to forest managers and conservators. Informing sustainable forest uses will enable long-term forest-derived benefits for rural communities to be secured, while simultaneously conserving forests and pollinators. Thank you. Great, let me just close this. Thank you very much for that. Elise has a question. Yeah. I'm just wondering why is this a particularly good area to do your study in and how did you come to choose this area? Um, well, I suppose the, the reality is that I'm actually from Zambia. So I live here and I, I kind of saw the gap and you know, not enough, not much research has been done in this area. Um, and I'm passionate about forests, so that's kind of got me started along that path. Um, yeah, that was the main sort of motivator. Great, thank you. Question, please. Um, in terms of yes. if you make some recommendations at the end of your research, I was wondering um, who you hope to to influence and impact with those recommendations, and how much autonomy do local communities have in terms of taking on board um, sort of suggestions for for better conservation of, of forests? It's quite a big question. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's it's very relevant. Um, yeah, so actually, I my I have permits to do my research through the Department of Forestry, which is probably the most relevant organisation, and I'm hoping to work a little bit closely with them uh, and share my results with them. So I have to, yeah, my my sort of goal is to come up with a policy note at the end of it to, to um, help guide these different managers. So there's conservation organisations, um, non-governmental organisations that work alongside these departmental. Um, government departments that you know all, all together kind of conserve um, forests along with traditional leadership like the chiefs and headmen so it is it's definitely a partnership and I'm hoping to kind of um, share all this information with all each of those different um, parties to to try and maximize the, the positive impact hopefully 
Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to our final speaker. Um, Antonino Scalia from the School of Civil Engineering is going to talk now about the analysis of slope failures on railway networks using INSAR data. Okay. Can you see the presentation now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, I'm Antonino Scalia. I'm a PhD student in civil engineering. And my research is about the safety assessment for earthworks along transport networks. So, um, did you know that in Ireland, in the UK, we have the oldest infrastructure networks in Europe? And did you know that the cost for maintaining this kind of infrastructure is about 50 million of, um, euro per year? So, um, this is definitely a huge amount, but this is nothing if you consider that the cost of emergency repairs in case of failures like this can be up to 10 times greater than the cost of continuous and planned maintenance for these uh, structures. And last but not least, sudden failures involving transport infrastructures can be extremely dangerous for the users. Consequently, it's imperative to assess the risk for this kind of earthworks. To do this, I'm focusing on remote sensing techniques, in particular in, um, on INSAR technique, which stands for interferometric synthetic aperture radar. It's a modern geodetics um, technique that allows us to monitor large earth surfaces and detect very tiny, very small uh, vertical movements on large surfaces. In this way, we are able to um, intervene to earthworks in general embankments and um, cutting before any failures can happen. So we can monitor um, these tiny movements and uh, and intervene before any any failure can happen. I already applied this method to an embankment, to a specific case, and uh, the results were surprising. Uh, the specific location that suffered from a failure basically got over the whole area the highest velocity rate of vertical displacement for four years before the failures. This means that with this technique, we first of all um, avoid the damage on the uh, networks, avoid economic damages, and overall. Um, risks for users. 